I'm going to go ahead and get started. We'll go through just a little bit of housekeeping stuff first. Um, I'm Dr. Leah Kay. I'm one of the three reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialists at the Fertility Center of Las Vegas. Um, we are located in the Sahara Lakes Business Park. So we're right in the middle of sort of the west side of town, very close to the Beltway in 215. Um, we are open for business despite all the COVID-19 craziness and we used to do these seminars in our office once a month in the evenings um, and unfortunately we had to stop doing that because now we have maximum capacity in the building but it's really nice to be able to do these webinars with you guys and help you to kind of follow along with us get a little overview of what it's like at our center and then hopefully we get a chance to see a lot of you um, in person. As I'm going through, I am um, going to share my screen, but I don't want it to feel like I, I am not listening to you guys, and I want you guys to feel comfortable asking questions. So if you haven't used Zoom before, there's a few ways that you can ask questions to me. If you are looking at the Zoom and you hover over it, there's a Q&A. There's also a chat option, and you can use either of those to send messages to me. I will try to kind of periodically take a look at what the messages are and see what folks are asking. Um, if I don't get to it right away, don't panic. I'm also going to set aside time at the end of this webinar to go through the questions and try to answer them more specifically. Um, and so we'll try to keep an eye on that as we go through. Otherwise, let me go ahead and, and expand this. And this topic is when does it make sense to see a fertility specialist? So I already mentioned we'll go through the housekeeping stuff a little bit. If you have questions, feel free to send them through the chat or the Q&A. Otherwise, after this is done, you're going to get an automatic email from our system that invites you to schedule a new patient visit with us if you haven't already. Um, and I recommend reaching out to us directly if you have more questions before you schedule. When you decide you want to schedule, you'll be put in touch with Debbie, who is one of our new patient coordinators. And she's going to go through and collect your personal information, a partner's information, if there's two of you trying together. She's going to collect any insurance information that you have available. And one of our goals is that before you have your first appointment with us, you've had a chance to fill out a little bit of health background information about yourself so that we know in advance you know, what your story is. And there's also an opportunity for us to see what your coverage looks like, what your benefits look like when it comes to insurance, so that you have a good idea of what are the costs for the visit up front, and additionally, kind of what to expect down the road in terms of testing and stuff that we'll get into, what's covered, what's not covered. So we like to get all of that stuff set up up front before you ever sit down and talk with one of the doctors, so that everything is ready to go when you speak with your doctor, you have your new patient, patient visit, then everything, we can hit the ground running to move forward with our testing as soon as possible. So keep an eye out on your email to see follow-up in terms of after this webinar, reaching out to be able to schedule a visit with us. Um, and for those who are already on our appointments um, schedule, we welcome you and thank you so much. So I'll talk a little bit about who we are at FCLV and, and what I think sets us apart from our competitors in the area. We'll talk about the bulk of the topic today, which is when to see a fertility specialist. And then we'll talk a little bit about what to expect at your first visit, what to expect for diagnostic testing. Some of this may be familiar if you've already started down this path with a regular doctor or a gynecologist. And we'll go into a little detail about what are those tests involve. And then we'll talk a little bit about, too, what are the options that we have to offer in terms of treatment once we figure out what's working, what's not working, where do we need to optimize things, where do we need somebody else to step in, like a third party. And then again, at the end, we'll leave time for question and answers. All right, so who are we at the Fertility Center of Las Vegas? FCLV has been in the Las Vegas area since 1988, and um, Dr. Shapiro in particular, who's the handsome gentleman in the center here, has been um, there that whole, this since he's one of the founding members or founding fathers of this practice. So I personally haven't been doing fertility treatment in the Las Vegas area for 32 years, but the center has and Dr. Shapiro has. Um, it's a practice that he's built from the ground up and that we are all extremely proud to be a part of. The things that I think set us apart are, one, he 
and as a result, the whole center is at the forefront of research. So IVF hasn't been around for 32 years. He has been, and he's seen all of it from the very beginnings and has taken a very large role in sort of developing IVF into what it is today. Um, it's very common in medicine for us to get set in our old ways, and it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, but Dr. Shapiro is the exception to that rule in that we are constantly doing research and gathering data to try to make our success rates better, try to make our IVF better, try to make our embryos stronger, and try to get more patients home with babies in their arms. And so you may not see it when you're in the office with us, but there is a lot of research happening in the background that we're really proud to take part of. And when you Google any of us doctors, you'll find that we're all doing a lot of publications. That's all in an effort to stay at the very forefront of this field of medicine. Um, we also have pretty high success rates. And these are things that you can look up online. If you look through the CDC website, all reputable centers in the United States are required to report our success rates and our pregnancy rates. And so you can look at ours. Um, what I like to make sure that patients know is that that is a direct translation of the quality of the laboratory associated with your fertility center. And not all laboratories are created equal. So as you are looking at the options and shopping around, one of the things I do recommend is that when you pick your center, you're not just picking your doctor and your team, but you're also picking your laboratory. And it's pretty hard to, to get a sense of a good lab or a bad lab. But those, the quality of the lab directly translate to the quality of your pregnancy success rates. And so I do recommend finding a center that knows what they're doing behind the scenes. So again, again, I mentioned that I'm one of the three um, REI specialists in the center. I'm Dr. K, but we also have Dr. Shapiro pictured here in the middle and Dr. Beatty in here, who's the tall one on the side. Dr. Shapiro, as I mentioned, has been here for a really long time. He is obviously fluent in English, but also Spanish and is working on Mandarin and German. Dr. Bedian also is English speaking and Spanish speaking. I unfortunately am the sole one in the office that relies heavily on a translator for other languages besides English. Um, but we, we're all very open to working with translators. And in fact, in our office, we have full-time staff that speak Mandarin, that speak um, German, that speak um, Portuguese, that speak Spanish. Um, I feel like I'm missing one, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. And so the hope is that everybody feels very welcome and included, even if your first language isn't necessarily English. All right, so let's get into the nuts and bolts. When does it make sense to see a fertility specialist? Well, I think it first makes sense to talk a little bit about what is it that we do as fertility specialists. The vast majority of couples are coming to see us because they wanna have a baby. Maybe you've been trying for a while and it hasn't happened. Maybe you've never tried before. You need to use donor sperm. You need to use donor eggs. You need to use a surrogate. Um, that is a big bulk of what we do, but we also are, trained as OBGYNs, which means that we did at least four years of residency in, in helping women who were pregnant and also in delivering babies. So that's sort of our background. Um, so we see a lot of women. That being said, we also see men with reproductive problems. Um, and we're trained in, in picking up that part in our subspecialty training. We also see women with gynecologic issues like fibroids or endometriosis or issues with irregular periods and anovulation and PCOS. Um, we'll see women who can get pregnant but have a hard time staying pregnant. Um, and we do a lot of fertility preservation. So maybe people that aren't planning to get pregnant anytime soon, but they know they'd like to in the future and they're either just not ready yet or they are facing some kind of medical treatment that they've been warned it could affect their ability to make sperm or make eggs in the future. And so the spectrum of what we do is very broad, even though it's you know fertility, there's a lot of things that fall under that umbrella. So when it, to see a fertility specialist kind of depends on your scenario. And it may not just be the classic story of a man and a woman trying to get pregnant in camp. That being said, that is a big part of what we see. So for heterosexual couples, if you are trying to conceive and you're not having success, the length of time that it makes sense to try depends a bit on age. Traditionally speaking, couples have infertility when they've been trying to get pregnant for 12 months without success. And that's 12 months of ovulating, 12 months of being able to have appropriately timed intercourse and still no pregnancies that timeline might be shorter in a lot of different scenarios. 
it's actually recommended that you see somebody at six months if you're over the age of 35, which doesn't really feel that old, especially now that I am over the age of 35. But unfortunately, when we're trying to reproduce, women are born with all of the eggs that we're gonna have. We don't make new eggs. And from the time that we are first conceived until the time that we're born, we're actually losing like 5 million out of the 6 million eggs that we started with. So you're born with 1 million. By the time you get your first period, you're actually down to 400,000 eggs for your lifetime. And then eventually we get to menopause where we're down to less than 1,000 eggs. And so in that spectrum of time between your first period and your last period, the rate at which we lose eggs is constantly picking up. So when you reach the age of 35, it does make you a more high risk pregnancy because you're at an older age and it also makes it more difficult for a lot of women to get pregnant. So six to 12 months is kind of the range when you wanna to start to talk with somebody, whether it's a gynecologist or specifically a fertility doctor, to just to figure out at least where are you at? What are the chances that if you keep trying, it's gonna work or do we need to do some other additional interventions to help? Um, the other big caveat that I will put in here is I am a bit of a bleeding heart and I am a bit of a type A. And so I can put myself in the same shoes as a lot of women who are trying to get pregnant and have been seeing negative pregnancy test after negative pregnancy test, period after period. And that starts to really add up. And it's a bit cruel in my opinion to tell patients that they need to wait a full year before they see somebody to make sure that everything is going okay. A lot of us are type A, just like me, and we wanna have control over a lot of things, or at the very least, we wanna know that we're not wasting our time. And so for, for couples that are worried there might be something wrong, for couples that are just kind of losing it in terms of level of stress and level of anxiety and getting these negative tests back to back to back, these are all perfectly legitimate reasons to see a fertility doctor and to not wait a full year before doing so. And so I do encourage patients to reach out, even if it just feels like you're at the end of your rope. And if you can logically tell yourself there's probably nothing wrong, that's very different from actually talking yourself down off of a ledge. And so we are here to help talk you down and here to arm you with information and with data about yourself so that you know if it's reasonable to keep trying for a year or if actually it's reasonable to do something different and more intensive now. All right. There are also situations where it makes sense to see a fertility specialist if you've been able to get pregnant, but you're having trouble staying pregnant. And this is something called repeat or recurrent pregnancy loss. One miscarriage is really common. And many, many couples that we talk to have had one miscarriage here or even two. It's actually not that uncommon. We don't hear about it much because in our society, we don't talk about it much because there's a lot of sadness that goes along with it. And there's a little bit of shame that goes along with it makes no sense to feel shame about one or two miscarriages or more, but it definitely is something that we don't recognize as a really common event, even though it is. When couples have had two miscarriages in a row or more than that, that's when we start to seriously consider that maybe there's something else going on. And so those are the situations where it may make sense to see a fertility specialist and to just make sure that there's not something else going on either structurally or hormonally or genetically or you know other medical problems, other medical diseases, all of these are things that can contribute to repeat miscarriages. So this is a really good reason to see a fertility specialist and make sure that if you can, you avoid putting yourself through that again. If you've ever had a miscarriage, you know that it is one of the darkest times. It's one of the hardest things to go through and to be going through it alone is especially hard. And so we're happy to be there to sort of help you cope and to, again, arm you with information to make sure that whatever you do next is the next right thing for you, okay? Another big reason for couples to come in and see us uh, or for individuals are gynecologic problems. So maybe you haven't started to try to conceive yet, but you have been told you have fibroids, uh, which can cause really heavy bleeding or really painful periods. Um, or maybe even told you have endometriosis, which is again, a syndrome of really painful periods and can cause a lot of internal scarring, can cause a lot of distortion to the uterus and where your pregnancy needs to grow. You know, in, in these gynecologic conditions, fibroids are 
uh, like a tumor balls. They're usually not cancer, but it's an overgrowth of the tissue here in the uterus that can make this cavity look abnormal. Endometriosis is implants of this uterine tissue on places it doesn't belong, like your fallopian tubes or out here on your ovaries. And it's very inflammatory and cause a lot of scarring. It can twist and distort your tubes. And now either of those kinds of problems can make it really hard for sperm that needs to be able to travel from here at the top of the vagina through the cervix, through the uterus, and out the open fallopian tubes to get out here and wait at the end of the tubes for when you release an egg. And so if you have been told you have any of these problems, don't wait a full year to find out that you're not pregnant when you wake up and look back at a year's gone by. See a fertility specialist sooner to figure out exactly what's going on. In some cases, you might need surgery to help correct some of these structural problems. And that is another big thing under the realm of what we do in our office. And so it may make sense to get checked out sooner and not wait a full year. The other thing I have listed on here is irregular periods. And this is a really common problem. It's most often due to something called PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome which is where women might get periods, but they're all over the calendar. Maybe you go three months without one, maybe you get two in one month. Some periods might last 15 days and others are just two days of spotting. Um, this syndrome is also associated with increased hair growth. So women that experience like male pattern hair on their chin or on their chest, male pattern balding, it can also be associated with bad acne. And so we have a lot of patients that get irregular periods. They just figure that's what's normal for them. Or what's also a really common thing is you get on birth control when you're young and you're trying not to get pregnant. Then when you eventually get off birth control to try to get pregnant, you realize that your periods are all over the place and they didn't used to be that way. Irregular periods, another great reason to come see a fertility specialist sooner rather than later and not give it a full year of trying to then find out that you just wasted a year of time. And all of that comes back to the fact that our eggs don't wait for us. As we get older, our egg supply goes down, our egg quality goes down. And so we don't want you to waste too much time trying to get pregnant if there are these clear and obvious things that might be getting in the way. All right, there are also women that would like to get pregnant that have other medical problems or men that would like to father children that have other medical problems. And it can be um, a little bit sneaky to think like, what does my high blood pressure have to do with my sperm production? What does my diabetes have to do with my eggs? Especially because you might not have any other signs of dysfunction. But these are things that we take for granted are probably normal until we actually start to look under the microscope or look on an ultrasound. And so if you are taking any medications, if you have any of these other medical problems, especially if they are hormone related problems like thyroid disease or diabetes um, or, or other common issues in that whole system, those can all disrupt the way that your body normally works to be reproductive, it can disrupt the way that you ovulate regularly, can dis disrupt your ability to make sperm. There are even some medications that make it very difficult for sperm to penetrate an egg. And there's so many different things that can go into this that it's almost impossible for you to use WebMD to figure out what's going on. And so this is where seeing a fertility specialist, again, sooner rather than later, makes some sense to just make sure that you're on the right medications to make sperm, the right medications to make eggs. You're on safe medications before you get pregnant so that you're not exposing a pregnancy to unsafe medications. And just making sure that everything is optimized before you get pregnant. We call all of this like preconception workup. So if all other things um, fertility wise seem to be normal, but you were diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease or something along those lines. These are reasons to see a fertility specialist. Okay. Other big reasons to see a fertility specialist is maybe you don't have sperm or you don't have eggs or you don't have a uterus. Or we see a lot of same sex couples that want to work with um, like a shared conception where one partner creates the eggs for a pregnancy and the other partner carries the pregnancy. So these are all um, treatments that we do every day, all day, uh, that involve things like using a sperm donor. They involve things like using an egg donor. 
We do surrogacy pregnancies all the time, and we do shared conception cycles all the time. So there are a lot of couples out there who've never tried to get pregnant before, or women and men that are interested in being single parents, where you know you're going to need heart, you're going to need help from a third party. And in those cases, definitely come to see a fertility specialist. Um, you can start out with a gynecologist or a regular doctor, just make sure that you're healthy to get pregnant. But ultimately you're going to need to have either donor eggs, donor sperm, a, a, a uterus to borrow um, or some other technologies to help you get pregnant. And so that's where we come in. And this is really the bread and butter of what we do. And I'll describe a few slides later, kind of what that looks like and, and what the technologies are. And then finally, another reason we see a lot of patients, and I alluded to this earlier, is for fertility preservation. So these are people who are not ready to get pregnant now, or who might potentially be facing an inability to get pregnant in the future for medical reasons or medications that you're gonna be on or bone marrow transplant. There's all kinds of things that can injure your ability to make eggs and sperm in the future. So a huge part of what we do is fertility preservation. For men, that means giving us a sperm specimen and we freeze it and hold on to it until you need to use it. And we counsel you about how do we use it in the future. For women, that might mean going through an egg freezing cycle where we stimulate you to grow a whole bunch of eggs in one cycle. And at the end of about two weeks of medications, we extract those eggs and then we put them in our freezer. And again, we hold on to them until you may need to come back and use them. In many of these cases, we have patients that don't ever need to come back to use them. And a lot of times plan A is, I'm gonna to try to get pregnant on my own when the time is right. But this way you have a little bit of extra insurance in the bank that if th things aren't easy when you're trying to do them in the future, because again, it comes back to that egg supply is always running low. If things aren't easy, you have this as your backup plan and you've set it aside and you've invested in yourself. So if you're interested in preserving fertility, or at the very least, just learning what your reproductive capacity is. Do I have sperm? Do I have eggs? Do I have a lot of eggs or am I running short on eggs? Am I an old 34-year-old or am I a young 34-year-old? All of these are questions that we often think about. The fertility specialist is well equipped to help you answer them, okay? All right, so what to expect for your first visit? This is, I mentioned it before, unprecedented times where back in the olden days, your first visit used to come into the office and meet with one of the doctors. And we all still have offices that we all still use, but they are much less heavily trafficked now due to COVID-19. So in fact, what to expect at your first visit is actually it's happening in the comfort of your own home, for a lot of my patients, it's happening in the comfort of their car in a parking lot, like during a lunch break um, outside of work. Um, in many cases, the, the silver lining about the whole COVID-19 is that used to be the case you would have to you know, take off work and find a time that if you were partnered that both of you could get into the office and see us. You gotta find a parking spot. You gotta wait in the waiting room for us, wait in a really, you know, we're always running a little bit behind, but. The nice thing about doing these remote visits is that in fact, you don't need to make your way all the way here. You don't need to find a place to park. You can be doing this from your couch. We can only see you from here up. So you could be doing this without pants. Um, and it's just a really comfortable way to get to talk to a doctor without the pressure of needing to do a physical exam right away. Um, and, and it's a really nice chance for both of you to be able to be on the call together with your doctor without having to switch around a bunch of work schedules and be driving across town like crazy people. So for your first visit, you can typically expect that it's gonna happen on Zoom. We promise not to use any filters. Usually at that time, if in an ideal world, we've already got a little bit of your medical background. Brownie biscuit. If you can hear my dog whining in the background, I apologize. Brownie Biscuit, be quiet. I gave her a little bit of pizza crust before this started, and so now she wants more. So on your first visit, we do a Zoom. We've already got a little bit of medical background about you, but the doctor that you're meeting with is going to dig in and ask even more questions about you. If your partner, they ask questions about your partner. If you have had tests already done with a gynecologist or a primary care doctor, if you have them available, we'll go over them. If you don't have them available, but you have an idea of what was normal and what wasn't, we'll talk about, all right, now that we have these things, what are the additional things that we need to check? The nice thing about your first visit is 
pants stay on, no physical exam, it's very low pressure, it's just talking. And what will happen is your doctor will get this medical background and then they'll talk about, okay, for the you or the two of you in particular, what does it make sense to do next? Things to come prepared with for that first visit is, is your list of medications. Also, vitamins and supplements are really important to us. This is also a chance in advance to ask about family history. Figure out what runs in the family. Figure out if anybody else in the family has had miscarriages before or gone through menopause early. Figure out if people have had breast cancer, colon cancer, or other like hereditary cancer syndromes. Because all of these things are really important to us when it comes to are you healthy to become pregnant? And are there things that we need to think about or worry about as we're creating your offspring? So we'll dig into a lot of that background stuff. And then we spend a lot of time talking about diagnostic testing and what do we do next? So what to expect for diagnostic testing? This is sort of a list of the different areas of evaluation that we'll talk about with you. If there is a man involved in your plan, we talk about a semen analysis for them. If that hasn't been done already, we want to make sure that there are sperm, that there's a lot of them, that they're swimming and they're goal driven and they're looking for an egg. We want to make sure that at least some small percentage of them look normal and picture perfect because a lot of sperm will come out with like two heads or two tails. They'll be swimming in circles because they have like a kink in their neck. So we want to know that that there's a, a reasonable number that are going to be able to access and fertilize an egg and make a healthy pregnancy. I have a lot of people ask, like, can, can the guy do their stuff later? Like, I just want to make sure everything's good with me. And that's not a unreasonable, but I will always tell patients about 50% of couples that are trying to get pregnant, male and female together, we find something subtly or significantly wrong with both members of that partnership. And so we can do just some testing initially and then go back and backtrack and do the additional testing. But the reality is what it mostly does is it just sets people back on time. And ultimately we find enough things wrong with men and the women that it makes sense to do the testing side by side together. And that's part of why at your new visit um, or your new patient visit, we, when we can, we like to have both partners there dig into both your histories because we consider you both equally important. There's also evaluation to take a look at the female hormones. I should mention, like this is kind of all the guys have to do is a semen analysis and a little bit of blood work. And like then all the rest of these tests here are related to the women in the partnership, of course, because that's kind of how un unfair infertility is. But essentially when we're looking at the females and, and women's testing, we want to get a good sense of what your hormone levels look like. And all of this is to get an idea of your ovarian reserve. So it comes back to that question of where am I in my reproductive timeline? Do I have a lot of eggs? Do I have a few eggs? What is my prognosis for this happening? Um, do I need to be more aggressive or do I have time to keep trying gentler methods? So we do some blood tests. We also do some pelvic ultrasounds or transvaginal ultrasound to take a look directly at your ovaries. And all of this puts together a picture for us of what are your ovaries doing? Are you ovulating regularly? And do you have a lot of eggs left to work with? The next kind of column here is related to the ultrasounds that we look, use to look at the uterus especially the sonohistogram. So a sonohistogram is a specialized ultrasound that looks internally at the inside of the uterus. And this is where things like fibroids come up or a really common gynecologic problem we see is uterine polyps. And when we do our sonohistogram, we have you come in and we put a, a speculum in place. We pass a little soft flexible catheter through the cervix. We take the speculum out and put a transvaginal ultrasound probe in. And then we send some salt water into the cavity to kind of blow up the walls of the cavity like a balloon. And that then gives us the ability to see what does the front and back wall of your uterus look like? And is there anything jutting into the cavity that's distorting it in any way? Because when you have sperm that's trying to get by or when you have an embryo that's trying to find a nice place to implant, those kinds of things definitely can get in the way. And so we do this sonohistogram to make sure that the inside of your uterus is a pristine cathedral to grow your baby in. We usually would do this test about a week after your period comes. Um, and for women that don't get periods regularly, don't fret. We can also kind of just check random hormones and actually bring on a period for you if we need to. But the goal is that you have a good clean out with a nice 
bleed. And then we can take a look at your water ultrasound or sonohistogram when the lining is a little bit thinned out so we can see small things in good detail. The next column here is to talk a little bit about the fallopian tube. So if you are a woman who has been trying to get pregnant, either with intercourse or with inseminations, and it hasn't happened, one of the common reasons that we see this happen is because the sperm just simply can't get to the egg. There's, a, there's an obstruction or roadblock in the way. So we have a test to take a look at the fallopian tubes, and it allows us to see that the tubes are open on one or both sides so that we know that sperm is able to get to where it needs to go. Um, this test is similar to the water ultrasound I described. We put in a little catheter through the cervix. We send some, this time dye, through the uterus. It fills up the fallopian tubes, and we want to watch it on an x-ray spill out both tubes. If you have a fill and a spill on both sides, now you know that the tubes are open, and sperm should be able to take the same path. This is another test that we do about a week after your period, and again, we can bring one on if you need us to. Um, if you have had things like a, a tubal ligation, if you had your fallopian tubes tied, we don't need to do this test, but that is absolutely another reason on the list to see a fertility specialist. We talk about how do we bypass the tubes if they've been cut, or if you do this test and you find out that they're blocked, what do we do to bypass them? The last column here talks a little bit about blood work. And along the lines of blood work too is some genetic testing. So after you have your first visit, we get a sense of what's already been done. If you've had blood work that's been done recently, we track down those results. We try not to repeat anything that's been done. If you haven't had anything done, then we're going to check some blood work. I mentioned some blood work already to talk about female hormones. That's going to be included in there. But the other blood work that we do is really just to make sure that you both are healthy to get pregnant. And that there aren't any diseases you could be passing back and forth to each other. And that you don't have any other medical problems that haven't been diagnosed yet. So these are things like diabetes, anemia, thyroid disease, things that you might want to know about and fix before you get pregnant, as opposed to enter your pregnancy with some medical problem that might affect your ability to stay pregnant and have a healthy for full term delivery. Also mentioned in this column is genetic testing, and that's a big thing of what we do in our field. So there's kind of two stages for genetic testing in our office. The first stage is one that you'll talk about at your first visit, and it's part of the diagnostic testing. If you opt to do it, what we offer in our office is genetic carrier screening. And what this is, is it's a blood test that you do that tells you what of, you know, a long list of like 300 diseases you might be a silent carrier for. So these are things like hemophilia or cystic fibrosis or, um, dwarfism, polycystic kidneys. These are things that you might be at a high risk for passing on to your offspring, but that you don't actually have yourself. And that's because you need to have two bad genes to have the disease. And if you're a carrier, you have one bad gene and you have one normal gene. Where this test comes into play is you figure out what you carry, and then you figure out what the person who's providing the other part of this, the eggs or the sperm, carries. In the case of a heterosexual couple, the men and the women both do this test and you get a sense of what you're a carrier for. And we match them up side by side and we just make sure that you're not both carrying the same genetic diseases. And that means you're compatible in terms of genetics. Let's say you are a woman who's planning to get pregnant with donor sperm. Sperm donors nowadays are all doing this exact same genetic carrier testing. So when you're looking at sperm donors, you're going to find that they're a carrier for one or two really weird things that you've never heard of. The way that you reassure yourself that you don't carry the same disease that they carry and that you're not going to have a baby that has that disease is you check yourself to figure out that you're not a carrier for the same things as your donor. So that's kind of the way that that genetic test works. The other part the other time when genetic testing comes into play, I'm going to talk about in a few slides, and it has to do with our IVF process. So I'll save that for a little bit. Um, but this is the first part of genetic testing is part of your diagnostic testing. Okay. So once you come into the office and you have your new patient visit and you go through all the tests, so we figure out what's going on. There are several sort of bread and butter things that we do in our office. So ovulation induction is one of those things. And this is just a fancy way of saying we can give women pills to help them ovulate or super ovulate. 
This is really important for women that have irregular periods. That often means that you're not ovulating on your own, at least not reliably enough to know when to have sex to get pregnant. So we give you pills to make it happen. And we can even observe with an ultrasound that you've responded to the pills and see when you're going to ovulate. We can also see what side you're going to ovulate from so that if you found out that you have a good tube and a bad tube, we can just maximize the cycles when you're ovulating from the side with the good tube. And all of this is, it allows us to improve your chances of becoming pregnant in a particular cycle. Another treatment option that we offer is called intrauterine insemination. And this is where we take sperm and we put it up at the top of the uterus. So in a more common scenario, sperm would get deposited here at the top of the vagina. And as I mentioned, a lot of sperm die here and that's why you need really high numbers. And then they gotta get up through the cervix to get up to the top of the uterus to then get out the tubes. In intrauterine insemination, we're able to bypass a couple of those major barriers like the vagina and the cervix. We're also able to optimize low numbers of sperm. If you don't have quite as many as most fertile men, we can use lower numbers and get by because we're getting them a boost. Um, and we often will also combine it with the ovulation induction, that hormone stimulation to help a woman to ovulate. This is a really common treatment for people that are going to use donor sperm, as long as your fallopian tubes are open and you have plenty of eggs. Um, this is also a really common treatment for men that have subtle sperm problems, not major ones, because you still need to have a minimum number of sperm for this procedure to work. And it's also a really good treatment for couples with unexplained infertility, where you go through all of the testing and everything comes back normal, but there's still clearly something wrong. You've been trying for a while and it's not happening. So intrauterine insemination is another like bread and butter um, treatment that we have to offer in our center. We also do IVF or in vitro fertilization, and this is a really common treatment nowadays. We will do this for a lot of reasons. We'll do this for women who have a lower egg reserve and we're trying to maximize the eggs that you've got left. We'll do this for women who have blocked fallopian tubes or injured fallopian tubes or endometriosis where the tubes are compromised. We will do this for um, same-sex male couples that need to have an egg donor. IVF is kind of how we harvest those eggs to create embryos. We will do this for um, Older women that are out of eggs, don't have quite so many left, but the uterus is great. We'll send an egg donor through an IVF cycle for you, create embryos, and then put the embryo back inside your uterus. Um, and we'll do this a lot too for fertility preservation. So I'll have couples that come in that may perfectly well qualify to do ovulation induction and intrauterine insemination, but they know that they want to have more than one kid. And so if you come in and you do an insemination, you get pregnant with the first kid, two or three years down the road when you're ready to get pregnant again, you kind of got to come back to the office and do all of this over again. And there's no guarantee that it's going to work because now you're a few years older. And so this is a really common treatment for people that know that there, there's more than one kid in their future. And the reason is when we do this, we can create several embryos at once and we keep the extras frozen to use in the future up to 30 years later, as far as we know. I don't recommend that you wait 30 years to have your babies, um, but that's kind of what is technologically possible. To give you an overview of how IVF works, what we do is we give you medications. These medicines are a little bit bigger. It's not pills like ovulation induction, but rather injections. And these medications stimulate your ovaries to grow as many eggs as we can. At the end of about two weeks, we do our egg pickup or we put a little needle through while you're asleep and comfortable. We give you great anesthesia. It's like the best nap of the year. But we go into each ovary and we extract as many eggs as we can from your ovaries. And now we have them in the dish. We then take the sperm and we'll do this treatment as well for men that have severely low sperm um, or need to have their sperm extracted directly from the testes, either for genetic problems or you've had a vasectomy in the past. When we're doing those kinds of things, we can work with really low numbers of sperm because we just need one sperm for every egg that you're making. We can take that sperm and we fertilize the eggs. And in many cases, we fertilize them directly where we take a sperm and we load it up into a needle. We inject that needle right into the egg and very gently drop the sperm off. So all it needs to do is show up and be chromosomally normal. We then put that egg with the injected sperm back into the incubator and we let an embryo develop. So an embryo will start out as a one cell. And after about five or six days, now you have an embryo that has like 
few hundred cells and it's at the stage where it's ready to be implanted. And in our good scenarios, we could, in an ideal world, get several embryos at this stage. At this stage, all the good embryos that you have get frozen. And this is actually where that other genetic test comes in. So we have the option to, when you do IVF, access your embryos outside of the body. And what we can do is I mentioned that this embryo has a few hundred cells. We take a sample of five or six of those cells from the outside of the embryo that's gonna be the placenta. We stay well away from the part of the embryo that's gonna be the baby. We don't want your baby to like be born with like half a nose or like a missing finger. We're getting it from the part that's gonna be the placenta and the embryo doesn't seem to miss those cells at all. We can send those cells off to a genetics laboratory and we can check for a number of things. Let's say, for example, you found out on your genetic carrier screening back in the diagnostic stage that you and your sperm provider are both carriers for cystic fibrosis, for example. If you know that you're at a high risk for passing it on and statistically speaking, 25% of your embryos are gonna have cystic fibrosis now, You've got your embryos in the dish, you send a biopsy off of each of those embryos and you figure out which ones have cystic fibrosis and which ones don't. And then you can just transfer the embryo that doesn't have it into the uterus and you get pregnant with that healthy embryo. You can also do genetic testing at this stage simply to screen your embryos to see which ones have normal chromosomes, 46XX or 46XY, and which ones don't. So Down syndrome is a really common example of an extra chromosome starting at the level of the embryo. So this test would try to screen out embryos that are going to potentially have Down syndrome, and then you only transfer back an embryo that's normal chromosomes. You can also figure out in doing this test if you're putting in a boy or if you're putting in a girl. If you have normal embryos of both genders and you have a preference for which one you would put in first, you let us know when we put that one in. And essentially, in an ideal world, if you have several embryos available, we thaw one embryo after we've prepared your uterus to get pregnant. So the uterus preparation involves another cycle of kind of giving you medications and hormones to get the uterus ready. We thaw your embryo, we put it into a catheter that easily fits up to the top of the uterus. We drop that embryo off there. You go off, 10 days later, hopefully you're pregnant, you go have your baby. And in the meantime, if you had extra embryos, we keep them frozen with us. And then two or three years down the road, when you're ready to get pregnant again, have a little baby brother or sister, you just come back, we get your uterus ready again, we thaw the next embryo in line and we put that one in. And the nice thing is you made it with your eggs a few years before when you were younger and your eggs were healthier. And so this is IVF. When we are doing things like fertility preservation or egg freezing, it's essentially the first half of this. We stimulate many eggs, we extract those eggs, and then we just freeze them as eggs. So we don't actually have to fertilize them and make them all the way into embryos yet. When we do egg freezing, that's essentially the first couple of steps of the IVF process. All right. So we also do a lot of surgery in our center. Um, you know, as OB-GYNs, we're trained in gynecologic surgery. And I mentioned the sonohistogram, which is that test to take a look at the inside of the uterus and make sure there aren't any major problems like fibroids or polyps. And so here's just an image of a sonohistogram. So this is a pelvic ultrasound and you can put a little catheter through the cervix and the black is the salt water. And when you send the salt water in, you can see here there's sort of this brighter white circular thing right in the middle of the cavity. And that is a picture perfect polyp. And so what we do when we find these is we as gynecologic surgeons are able to have you come back in, have you go to sleep and again, get the best nap of the year. Because so while you're asleep and comfortable is when we want to do this. We take our little camera, we can put the camera through the cervix, we have tiny scissors, and we just cut away at that base of that polyp, we'll pull it out, and here's that pristine cathedral left behind. So surgery is another common thing that we have to do to help patients get pregnant. All right, so it's a lot of biology. It's a lot of stuff that most of us don't ever feel like having a conversation with another person about, including even our partners from time to time. And it's a little bit gross. But at the same time, I'm hoping that you walk away feeling like it's a little bit impressive too. The things that we are capable of doing these days are just absolutely amazing. And that's really what inspired me to go into this field. I mentioned it's rapidly evolving because there's still so much research and so much development going into all of the technologies that we have available that the things that used to just be science fiction are now happening on a daily basis.
Um, I say that also to just encourage patients that don't feel like they're maybe the traditional couple trying to get pregnant. Please know that in 2021, the way that we build families looks all kinds of ways. And when you come into our waiting room, you're going to see all kinds of people with different goals and different ways of reaching those goals among you. You'll see them all wearing masks. In the time of COVID, I mentioned our office is open. We do have some different ways that we're operating to keep you safe and to keep our staff safe. So when you come in to see us in the office, we ask that you wear a mask. And if you don't have one or if you got one, we'll give you one. Um, we also are checking temperatures at the door to make sure that nobody slips in that has a fever they didn't know about. We are going through like a COVID questionnaire before you walk through, pretty standard. You're probably running into that in a lot of the places that you might need to travel these days. And we also are trying to keep our traffic in the office to a minimum. And so that means not bringing in a lot of extra people with you for your exams, unless it's one of our more important things like our embryo transfer or some of our inseminations, we'll let you bring your partner in. Um, we're having people eat in like their car rather than the waiting room so that there's not a lot of people gathering all at once. We have the front door locked at all times so that you have to call us when you park at the parking lot and we'll come to the front and we'll let you in. But that allows us to really screen everybody before they come in and keep all of you safe. So those are some of the things that I mentioned when it comes to kind of what does the world look like in fertility with COVID-19 as, as a thing. Uh, a common question that people will often ask is like, is it okay to be getting pregnant right now? Like COVID-19 seems pretty bad when I'm not pregnant. What happens if I get it when I am pregnant? The other question is like, should I be getting a vaccine? COVID-19 is definitely bad. Vaccines can be a little bit scary, but I promise you COVID-19 is worse. And our general recommendation is that if you are pregnant or if you're trying to become pregnant, if the vaccine is available to you, we strongly encourage you to get it. We don't know much about risks or harms from the vaccine in pregnancy, but we definitely know about a lot of risks and harms from COVID-19 in pregnancy. And so right now is the time to get it if you're offered it. Um, the, the vaccine can give people a fever, a little bit of a fever for one or two days after the vaccine. I'm guilty, I felt the same way. You don't feel great after you get, especially the second shot. So what we tell patients if you're trying to get pregnant is to avoid high fevers and keep Tylenol on hand and take Tylenol at the first instance that you're not feeling well. And that allows you to um, keep fevers at bay so that it, a high temperature can actually injure an early pregnancy if it's developing. So that's kind of the strategy for being able to take the vaccine and still feel safe with continuing to try to conceive at the same time. All right, so this is sort of my thank you slide. Again, you can find us here at the Fertility Center of Las Vegas or in person in the Sahara Lakes Business Park at 8851 West Sahara, suite number 100. Um, we are very active in social media. And when I say we, I don't particularly mean me, but we pay very good people at social media to be very active on our social media profile. And so this is a good way to figure out what's going on with us, get a lot of more information about trying to conceive and you know, things like supplements, things like vaccines, a lot of those common questions that come up. I also would encourage you, Dr. Bedient has a blog called um, Fertility Docs Uncensored. So not a blog, sorry, a, a podcast. So if you are a podcaster and you're interested in listening, um, Dr. Bedient is on there and they come out with really regular episodes about a lot of common topics for people who are trying to get pregnant or building their families. And so with that, let me pause and take a step back and see if we've got any questions, if we've got any um, things that you guys wanted to make sure that you asked while I take a quick drink of water. Water wine. You don't know what's really in that cup. Okay, I'll stick around for another 10 minutes or so. If you have questions, I will answer them on here. But if you need to run, I also respect your time. Feel free to jump off. And I will just finally say, if you don't already have a new patient visit appointment with us, I highly encourage you to schedule one so we can see you and really dig into your, your potential questions, your potential concerns, and help you to get pregnant. 
So I did see a question just pop up asking if we could explain the IUI option again. So IUI stands for intrauterine insemination. And what I like to do is I like to do a little bit of drawing. So I'm going to share my screen and sort of use my cursor a little bit better to actually sort of show you like what is IUI. So intrauterine insemination is where you get sperm from some source. It could be a partner. It could be donor sperm that comes from an anonymous donor bank, which is really common. It could be an, a donor that you know, that we've gone through a lot of screening to make sure that they're healthy and suitable to be a sperm donor for you. But essentially you get sperm. And so let me draw my sperm in here. When we do IUI or intrauterine insemination, what we usually do is we start actually at the beginning of your cycle with a period. You call us when your period car car starts and we have you come in on your period and we're going to take a look at your uterus, make sure that it looks normal. There hasn't been anything that's developed in here like a polyp. We're going to take a look at your ovaries and make sure that generally they're quiet. They should be quiet when you're on your period. There shouldn't be any big cysts or follicles. And if all of that looks good, then you go off and you start to make an egg. That could either be naturally, if you have regular cycles and you make an egg on your own, or in a lot of cases, this is where we do something like super ovulation or ovulation induction. These are just two words, two terms to describe the same exact thing. But essentially we give you pills that help to make you make a couple of eggs, maybe instead of just one. Try to double the chances of you getting pregnant that month. And so you go off after your period starts, you take pills for usually like five nights. That's how ovulation induction usually works. And then you come back in several days later so we could do another ultrasound. And on that ultrasound, we're looking to see your ovaries again and make sure that you responded to the medicine, see how many follicles you have. And if there's a couple of them, we talk about like, what are the chances of this working? We're also checking to see that you don't have like 18 follicles that are ready to rupture. Um, you know, I, especially not tonight, don't particularly have a face for TV. Uh, and so I don't need a TV show. I don't want you to have a TV show. We don't need you to buy a minivan and build your whole family one shot. Like we like you to have one to two follicles, but we do this special ultrasound on day 12 to make sure that you don't have a lot of follicles that are about to rupture. So we look at your follicles and we see how big are they and when do we think that they're gonna ovulate? And in many cases too, we will actually give you medications to trigger the process of ovulation. We can literally take your brain out of the whole picture if we need to. So we give you a medicine to help you to, to trigger ovulation. And then we have an idea of roughly when you're gonna drop this egg or both eggs, if it's both of them. And what we try to do is we do our intrauterine insemination shortly before these eggs drop. So when you start the process of ovulating, you get your brain sends this loud signal and it's about 40 hours later, like almost two days that that egg is actually going to pop and ovulate. So the goal is get sperm in there before you reach that 40 hour mark, because in an ideal world, you want the sperm to be waiting out here at the end of the tubes so that when the egg drops, that fallopian tube finds that egg, it scoops it up and then it can fertilize it. And now you've got a fertilized egg that travels back down to implant. So when we do an IUI or an intrauterine insemination, we figure out when you're going to ovulate and then we schedule the IUI. If you're using donor sperm, we have a file, a vial that you've purchased that we keep in our freezer until that morning. We're going to thaw the vial of sperm that morning. You come in, we get a good look and make sure there's still plenty of sperm that survived that thaw. And then we can load them up into a little catheter and you come in and get a speculum exam. We take a look at your cervix and then we just load the little catheter through and we get to the top of the uterus and we drop those sperm off here. And then they still got to do some swimming. Like it's not completely hands-free for them. They got to find a way out the tubes. But essentially we are getting the sperm much closer so that it only takes maybe 15 to 20 minutes for the sperm to travel out these tubes. When you have intercourse, you drop the sperm off here. A, a lot of them die here. This is an acidic battleground for sperm. Many of them are gonna get trapped in the cervix because the cervix is kind of like a thick mucus and it's like a water slide going in the wrong direction. So you end up with just fewer numbers in the uterus and fewer numbers that make it out here. And it takes a lot longer for them. Whereas when we do an insemination, we bypass the vagina, we bypass the cervix, and we get them way up here so that it doesn't take them as long and we can get away with smaller numbers. 
So if you're using a donor with all your vial about an hour before your insemination appointment, if you have a partner who's going to provide fresh sperm, they would come in first thing that morning, give us a sperm specimen, we we'll process it and wash it and concentrate it down. And then you come in a couple hours later and we'll put the sperm up inside of the top of the cavity so that we're giving it a boost, getting it closer. Hopefully that makes, uh, that makes sense. Other questions? Let's see. I do often get frequently asked questions about things like cost. So let me talk a little bit about cost because it's something that's on all of our minds. The When you come in to see us for a first visit, this is where you give us all your insurance information in advance. So we can give you a very clear idea of if you've got a copay for the visit, if it's a cash pay visit. We also will give you an idea of what is covered and what is not covered when it comes to diagnostic testing. So all those tests that I talked about a few slides back. And I like to think about it in diagnostic versus treatment because it can get a little bit muddled. It's a very overwhelming topic. There are some insurance companies that will cover diagnostic testing. They will pay for some part of your water ultrasound, your tube test, all this blood work, your semen analysis. There are other insurance companies that don't cover that or anything. And we're going to have a good idea of which you are before you get started. And after you meet with your doctor, you're then going to meet with a new patient coordinator who's going to walk through, all right, here are the tests your doctor wants you to do. Here's what's going to be covered by insurance. Here's what your copay is going to be. Or if there's nothing covered by insurance, here's what our cash package prices are. And here's how our, here's our strategies to try to get things done for as inexpensive as possible so that you can save money for treatment options. Then the other half of that is treatment. So insurance companies will either say that they do or they don't cover treatment when it comes to infertility stuff. And so if you have insurance coverage for anything, when we've talked again, so you'll have your new patient visit, you'll go off and do all the testing, you'll come back and have a, a post, like a consultation with your doctor to go over all the results. And when we have a good idea of what your treatment option is gonna be, we then have the financial team put together a quote for you for that particular treatment. If there's any insurance coverage for it, they're going to run it through your insurance company and get prior authorization. And then they're going to send you a quote that says, here's what insurance is going to cover. Here's what's going to be due by you cash at this particular time. If there's no insurance coverage, then we're going to give you an idea again of what our global cash package is. And a lot of couples do have to rely on medical financing as well. So when we're sending you our quotes, we're also sending you information about medical financing companies that can, you can apply for a medical loan. And that company will pay that amount on your behalf up front. And then you make monthly payments to them if you have to, especially if you're having to pay for one of our more expensive treatments. So that's some of the, just a little bit of information about the financial stuff. When it comes to like the prices for the different treatments, there's a lot of ballpark numbers that get tossed around. But the reality is a lot of it's going to be very specific to you and what exactly you need and don't need. In general, things like an insemination starts at around like fifteen to eighteen hundred dollars a cycle. But you also have to keep in mind that the success rate's lower, and so you may need to do several cycles before it works or before you decide you don't want to do that anymore. IVF cycles start at about $16,000, but it has a much higher success rate. And as I mentioned, it allows you to preserve fertility for the future so that when you need to come back and get pregnant again, if you need help again, when doing IVF, you've set aside future children in addition to your current child. And so that's kind of ballpark numbers for like our global um, packages in terms of cash pay. Um, as you get more information and when you have your new patient visit, we dig into those things a little bit more too. And so those are just ballparks. Um, what it'll actually look like to you depends a lot on your own situation. We do offer um, a military discount. So if you're military, please let us know up front. We also offer a teacher discount. So if you're a teacher or your partner's a teacher, please let us know up front. All right, let's see. So there's another great question for an IUI. Would a husband give this sermon, the semen within a certain time frame prior to the procedure? So if we're doing a fresh IUI, then yes, they would usually come in about two hours before your IUI is scheduled. So usually the guys will come in around like seven or eight in the morning, and then the women will follow somewhere around like 10 to 1130 in the morning. And so it's sort of like a one morning procedure. 
There are definitely situations where people do IUIs for convenience because perhaps like your husband doesn't work in town and he travels a lot. And when you know you're ovulating is when he is always gone. And so we will also have couples where the partner will come in and do a sperm collection in advance and we'll freeze it. And then that way, if he needs to be traveling for work um, and you are ovulating, we just thaw the sperm vial and we do that about an hour before the procedure and then we can put it in place. So there technically is like a time frame, usually within a couple of hours before the procedure. There's a lot of flexibility in that when, when we're trying to work around busy schedules, okay? Um, estimated cost for IUI starts, depending on what you need and don't need, starts usually at about $15 to $1,800 per cycle. That's if you don't need to purchase sperm. Um, if you do need to purchase sperm, the cost for the sperm depends on the bank that you're purchasing it from when you pay for the sperm directly to the bank. As sperm, a vial of sperm can cost anywhere between like six to $800 a vial. All right, so with that, I will let you guys get back to your busy evenings. Luckily, my dog has forgotten about the pizza crust and so she's curled up in a ball and ready to eat some real dinner. I hope to see many of you soon in the office. Please feel free to reach out to us and, and, and schedule a new patient visit if you don't already have one. And um, any additional questions, you're welcome to always reach out to us. We're happy to answer them.